Hi, I'm John Pilcher. I'm a bariatric surgeon in San Antonio. Today's March 25th of 2020, and we're somewhere near the beginning of the novel coronavirus pandemic. This video is not about that pandemic, but the pandemic has stopped us from doing lots of surgery other than urgent things, and has given me time to reflect on some stuff that's been nagging at me for quite some time. Now, usually in these videos, I like to talk about surgical facts, surgical concepts, medical care, medical logic, the science of obesity and bariatric surgery, but today, it's more of an emotional topic. This is going to be a, against obesity prejudice. Ever since I started doing bariatric surgery back in the mid-90s, many of my patients have been accused of taking the easy way out with surgery. This has always pissed me off, but until recently, I haven't stopped to analyze why I found it so irritating. My first thought was that I was reacting to an insult against me personally or against my work. Of course, what we all want to do in the world is we want to do good. So if someone is questioning or dismissing our work, um, that can be pretty offensive. But that wasn't really what was going on because even going back to when I began doing bariatric surgery in the 90s, I had medical colleagues who would ask me straight up, hey, Pilcher, why are you disrupting the normal intestinal anatomy to treat a behavioral condition? And, um, and that was wrong on the face of it, that question. But I didn't take it as an insult or something that made me angry. I took it as an opportunity to educate. It was the beginning of a conversation to help them understand that they were working off of outmoded concepts, which we're going to go through, and to help them understand a more modern way of understanding the obesity condition and how we treat it from a medical and surgical standpoint. So once I realized that it wasn't about me and insulting me, I started thinking a bit deeper and uh, realized that what really seems to be going on is that this is a manifestation of obesity prejudice. And it's prejudice against the people who suffer from obesity, who in a sense, not even realizing, are helpless against this prejudice. And that's what makes me mad. That's what we're going to explore further in this video. Let's look at that word prejudice for a minute. This definition comes from dictionary.com. Prejudice. Noun. An unfavorable opinion or feeling formed beforehand or without knowledge, thought, or reason. 2. Any preconceived opinion or feeling, either favorable or unfavorable. 3. Unreasonable feelings, opinions, or attitudes, especially of a hostile nature, regarding an ethnic, racial, social, or religious group. Check me on this. Is prejudice really the right term to use for the skepticism about treating obesity as a medical problem? I really think it is the right term, and I'm being intentional about selecting a term that's odious, something that thoughtful and constructive people don't do. Let me unpack the skepticism piece, and then we'll return to the definition of a prejudice and see if it fits. There's always been this intuitive understanding that the obesity condition comes from two factors, too much eating and not enough exercise. Even a simple layperson can see that these two factors do have an impact on weight. People like your Aunt Jane, who has no weight problem, are happy to let you know that when she eats less and exercises more, that her weight improves. It's so obvious, right? And in the early days, the medical community bought into this intuitive idea. They dressed it up with some concepts. They said, okay, too much eating is too many calories in, and not enough exercise is not enough calories out. And then later they put some math to it and dressed it up further as the thermodynamic theory of weight loss. This simple mathematical approach to weight control was the prevailing practice until the 80s and the 90s of the last century, and it still is an underlying reflex assumption for many physicians who have not taken the trouble to go back to school for the new concepts. I've invested a whole separate YouTube video in debunking the thermodynamic theory of weight loss, but for now I want to call out one key assumption that does not show up anywhere in the math of this old outmoded narrative. The key assumption written into the entire fabric of that outmoded narrative was that each individual has complete conscious control of their calories in and their calories out. That assumption about complete conscious control is incorrect and it ignores some important biological facts. But it was the universally held belief for many centuries and it led naturally to the idea that each person's weight was a matter of personal choice, personal responsibility, personal willpower. We're going to call this old debunked idea, the willpower narrative. And according to the willpower narrative, if a person doesn't choose to be fit and healthy, then it must be a matter of poor choices or poor discipline. Furthermore, if we understand that each individual is fully able and conscious and responsible for their own fitness, then if they don't fix it, it must be 
their fault. And furthermore, if they don't choose to fix this obvious problem, the weight, then perhaps society or individuals can help these people with some blame and some shame as motivations to get their willpower boosted up a little bit. When I spell it out like this, most people agree that this can't really be the whole story about the obesity condition. After all, just for example, most folks know that genetics has a lot to do with excess weight. And in a minute, I'm going to talk a bit more about the biological understanding and a better, more constructive understanding about how to approach the obesity condition. But now, having set the table, I want to come back to the idea that this is really a prejudice situation that we're trying to move away from. We're going to look back at some key parts of that prejudice definition. Let's focus on the word unfavorable. Obviously, society is judging those with obesity. Look at opinion or feeling formed beforehand or without knowledge, thought, or reason. This means founded on old, unexamined ideas, not on fact. The assumption that obese people have 100% conscious control of their weight is so deeply ingrained that people use it as a reflex assumption. Even people who recognize on a different level, on a conscious level, that other factors come into it, biology and genetics, still say things like, well, they should be able to do it on their own, or they should be able to just take care of the weight through willpower and exercise. So this is how prejudice can look, right? Not only does society blame the person for not fixing their own disease, society judges them as being less intelligent, less motivated, less able, and less worthy. That's what makes me mad, and the main purpose of this video is to provide a more accurate way of thinking about the obesity disease. It just so happens that moving away from obesity prejudice should lead to more effective and constructive approaches to the condition instead of remaining stuck in that failed old willpower narrative. And by the way, I'm a big believer in personal responsibility, personal effort, and personal choice. The difference for me is that the mind and the will need to work with a powerful pre-existing biological system that's only partially subject to conscious control. More on that later. Back to the obesity prejudice for a moment. Where is it coming from? Obviously, it's coming from society as a whole. Notice, however, that some of the most painful blame and shame are coming from those who are close to you, from family and friends. Everyone has an Aunt Jane who feels perfectly free to give her opinion that what works for her ought to work for you too, right? But I believe that the most poignant source of the blame and shame are from the self-same individuals who suffer from the obesity condition against themselves. The old willpower narrative has been so pervasive for so long that on a deep reflexive level it's even believed by the people who know for themselves that they've done everything humanly possible. Now, just about every new patient I meet in initial consideration for a bariatric surgery says something along the lines of, I know I should try harder. I feel like a failure. They've internalized the willpower narrative to such a degree that they assume it's true. They don't even realize they're making the assumption. This is coming from people who've used willpower with diet and exercise to lose 50 or 100 pounds, which is an amazing accomplishment. These folks generally follow a food plan that's quite sensible and healthy, but it just doesn't cause weight loss in the context of their distorted biology. These people are fully successful in career, family, projects, and somehow it's fair to say they lack focus and willpower? No, I disagree. It makes me sad to hear this self-criticism, and I hope today, within this video, at least I can convince some of you to stop shaming and blaming yourself. Maybe with some of these concepts and language tools and some trust, you can bring family and friends around to a more constructive understanding. And it will take a, lo a long time, but I certainly hope that someday society's understanding will align with science rather than the old willpower blame narrative. As we discuss a more accurate and constructive story to understand the obesity disease, and as we hopefully move away from obesity prejudice, let's understand that prejudice is an evil action, but those who have and display prejudice are mostly not evil people. They're simply misguided by ingrained assumptions written into the old narrative, the old willpower narrative, and if they have a willing heart to accept new ideas, then they can let go of harmful and counterproductive action. Why am I, as a logical surgeon, bringing heart into the discussion? It's because these deeply ingrained narratives have the character of a religious belief. Compelling information alone doesn't change traditional assumptions. One needs to feel open to new ideas as well. One needs to feel the effort of change is worthwhile. That's why I want to begin with you as the one who is already living with this pain and this discomfort. I hope you believe it is worth some energy and some work in order to let go of the self-blame and guilt you may have felt over your failure to do it on your own or lose weight the right way. Notice the judgment that comes with the right way. 
I hope that we as a society can use the ideas in this video and other ideas to move emotionally away from the willpower narrative of obesity to a medical management narrative like we use for diabetes. Most people understand that diabetes management includes conscious focus on proper diet, but patients are not expected to be fully in control of their diabetes with willpower alone. It's understood that diabetes is a biological metabolic disease that can be impacted by choices and discipline, but also that medical management and drug treatment are often necessary. There's no blame in this, and the lack of blame means that patients come forward willingly for the treatment they need. Since there's no negative judgment, medical professionals address the diabetes condition proactively, and they naturally adjust the intensity of treatment to the stage of the disease in each patient. In other words, they don't withhold treatment just for the patient to prove that the patient needs to try hard enough, as is done in obesity. I just want us to treat the obesity disease in a way that is logical, proactive, and constructive, like diabetes. In this video, I'm not going to discuss all the basic science that underpins the change from the willpower narrative towards the biological approach to obesity management, but I'm going to use that knowledge to describe a more modern understanding of the relationship between the mind and the will and the body with biology. Again, the real story is that the mind and the body are inextricably linked together. There are whole books written about this, but for our purposes here, it's going to be useful to think about these as two separate entities the mind, will, and the body biology that work in relationship or in partnership, often not in partnership. The willpower narrative assumes that biology is a domesticated junior companion of the mind. The mind is considered to be in control, and biology conforms to the will of the master. Even if biology gets a bit spunky or playful from time to time, there's no question about who is in charge. This represents the willpower narrative of weight control. The real story is that the biology in the body is a much bigger beast than the mind, and the biology has its own powerful reflexes, habits, and urges that may or may not fit with the mind's fine conscious ideas. In reality, this makes sense because we can only survive if biology is powerful and complex and automatic. The conscious mind has no scope to monitor and adjust survival systems such as blood flow, temperature regulation, or breathing. The fat storage system is another one of these survival mechanisms, and some degree of fat storage is actually a survival resource for any organism to survive between meals and move around. The problem is that for many people in our modern civilization, some combination of genetics and the environment, most likely including the industrial food supply, causes this powerful unconscious system to fall out of balance so that the body biology wants people to have massive excess fat stores. Now we know that this is logically and medically unsafe, but again, there's a disconnect. The body is responding to its own reflexive primal survival resources, its own survival impulses, and it's not necessarily subject to conscious logical control. In other words, the body is going to act on an instinctive level to do what it thinks is best for survival in spite of what the mind tries to redirect it to do. This concept of the mind as a rider on a large untamed beast that has its own impulses can help explain one of the tricky misleading things that help the willpower narrative seem so natural and obvious. The fact is that most people who have excess fat can lose some weight through diet and exercise. At first blush it seems obvious to conclude that more diet and more exercise to lead should lead to more weight loss. But the fact is that 98% of people with serious obesity run into kind of like a wall and can't get any lower even with strenuous effort. Picture this as the mind and rider trying to move the beast to a place of its choice, and the beast may move a little bit with the yelling and kicking and whipping, but after a little while, once the beast gets a certain distance away from where its impulses want it to go, let's say some water or some food, if we're using the beast analogy, fat storage in the case of the obesity condition, the further the beast moves, the more resistant it becomes until the beast just stops, and then it will stubbornly maintain its position in spite of everything that the mind is trying to do. In fact, the harder they try, imagine the rider doing more screaming or kicking or whipping, it's just going to make the beast angry. And the next thing you know, the beast is off on its own course uh, in the weight situation. It's returning to where it thinks the body should be. So this image of the biology and the impulses being a dominant factor in where the weight goes is the rest of the story in the biology of obesity control. The body can stubbornly, stubbornly maintain excess fat levels in the face of extensive and strenuous efforts by the mind and the will. This image of the body and the biology as being the dominant influence in weight control is the most accurate picture, and this is why the willpower narrative and the thermodynamic theory don't apply. 
the body is following its survival impulses and it will stubbornly defend the fat resource as a survival advantage uh, in spite of anything that the mind wants to do if the body is out of balance. This concept of the body and biology having a very significant impact on weight control also captures the fact that there's big biological variability among individuals in the human population. A lot of people have a healthy biological balance, and in those lucky folks, the biology beast is perfectly content to maintain small, healthy, appropriate fat stores. The mind and writer for those people is perfectly happy to take credit for the fact that biology is performing in a healthy way. Aunt Jane proclaims that loudly, right? My aerobic class and my healthy eating. Uh, but very often, it's more luck than will or intelligence. No offense, Aunt Jane. Fortunately, the power of the biology in this beast body is not the end of the story. We can seriously reshape the relationship between the mind and the writer and the biology with medical and surgical management. As I've explained more extensively elsewhere, bariatric surgery actually works on a hormonal biological level so that the body on a basic survival level no longer wants to hold on to the excess fat. This is like rewiring the impulses of biology. And in current medical jargon, we say we're reducing the body's set point of fat to a lower healthier level. Now this is not a magical change where everything is suddenly moonbeams and rainbows, but it's still fair to say that we convert the mind-biology relationship into one that is much more healthy. The mind now has tools for guiding the biology slash body, and the body is trained with a predisposition to perform in a healthier way. Earlier I said that I'm all about personal responsibility and conscious focus, and it's really important for our bariatric surgical patients to do a lot of work to keep that healthy balance and to keep the mind-body working in harmony. Without regular and conscious attention to the body, training it and nurturing it, the body's impulses will get off track, and the mind will again find itself as a helpless rider. In the context of bariatric surgery, regular and conscious attention means at least healthy eating, regular exercise, taking vitamins, regular lab work, showing up for regular follow-up for accountability for further teaching, and um, the time invested with that. And all that is not even to mention, which are minor compared to the gumption that it takes to get on the operating table and let people like me go in and rearrange the otherwise normal internal organs for a hoped for metabolic benefit. So real medical and surgical management of the obesity condition is a lot of work. And that's another reason it pisses me off when my patients are accused of taking the easy way out. Fact is that these folks have already been doing a lot of hard work over the years, but it hasn't paid off. Really, if it's not working, then why keep beating your head against the wall? Hopefully the difference with our help is that the work pays off with a health benefit. At the very least, if you're a person suffering from the obesity disease, then stop being so hard on yourself. Break the cycle of blame and self-criticism in your own head. Give yourself some grace and give yourself some credit for the work you've done, even if you didn't achieve lasting success. Then once you accept that you are not to blame, use that focus and will, which you do have, likely in ample measure, and get yourself the help and the medical assistance that you deserve. Thank you.